So the first, and I'll do these in order, and there's some great, excellent questions to look like. So it says, first one, it says, do you request contrast studies for gallbladder polyps? Well, um, I am certainly not the expert in, in contrast for the gallbladder. Um, you know, we generally don't use contrast media in, in our practice. Um, so I don't really have expertise in that area, but I, I, I generally, I would say the answer is no. Uh, I'd have to look at the literature on this. Most of these are small. Um, you know, certainly if it's a true neoplastic quote unquote process, it's going to have flow to it. So it's certainly a great thought, but I don't see how it's going to, you know, going to change, you know, change management, honestly. Um, next question, is there a grading for adenomyomatosis? Not to my knowledge, um, you know, I, I would say, um, you know, certainly I, I would talk about the extent of it. Again, it's quite variable. Um, I don't think it really makes a big difference to my knowledge. You know, it's generally an asymptomatic process. Um, you know, if the patient has, you know, chronic pain and it's ascribed to the gallbladder, is it possible that they have some sort of dyskinesia that's ascribable to it? Maybe. But in my take on the review of the literature, it's generally asymptomatic. So, you know, do you say mild, moderate, severe? Not really. I, I usually just describe the extent of it. Um, it says, please show the image of hemorrhagic cholecystitis again. Well, I think you can access the, the webinar at your leisure. So rather than go through, you know, 40 slides, I'll have you do that again, but it, it basically was the non-contrast image, and it, and it really wasn't hemorrhagic cholecystitis. It was blood extending into the lumen of the gallbladder in the setting of a very complex internally hemorrhagic diffuse hepatocellular carcinoma, right? That was the explanation ascribed to the hemorrhage in the lumen of the gallbladder. The patient had you know, very complex vascular involvement, and that's presumably why it happened. Okay, next question from uh, uh, Ken Siegel. Um, it says, do you count as, uh, what do you count as an actual sonographic Murphy sign? Uh, how do you differentiate from right upper quadrant pain, which is the usual indication for the study? So again, unfortunately, I'm generally not the one at the bedside. So we are highly reliant on our, again, generally excellent ultrasound technologists for making the call as to whether they believe there is a sonographic Murphy sign. And if you recall going back to, you know, Bates, remember Bates, uh, introduction to the physical exam, that's where I learned about the physical exam Murphy sign. The Murphy sign on physical exam is that you palpate the right upper quadrant, have the patient take a breath in, and if they sort of abruptly stop that inspiratory effort, it's like a, you know, that is ascribed to pain when the gallbladder touches the examiner's finger, right? That is not the same as a sonographic Murphy sign. The sonographic Murphy sign is its point of maximal tenderness, right? And we might do the same thing with the right lower quadrant or other parts of the body when we're, uh, you know, trying to figure out what is the thing that is causing discomfort. The problem, of course, is that pain radiates, right? So, you know, uh, it, 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 one of the classic differential presentations uh, or, or differential considerations in, in acute, uh, in aortic dissection is cholecystitis. So, you know, I always say, regardless of ex your exact protocol for CT angiography and suspected aortic dissection, and the vast majority of them are negative, you have to at least go to the mid admin because you can have an acute gallbladder, and this has been shown over and over again. So uh, pain can absolutely radiate as well. So they're not the same. Um, and again, it's, it's really reliant on the sonographer, you know, being careful and saying, yes, the pain corresponds to the probe location corresponding to the gallbladder. Okay, next, next question says, do you consider saying an echogenic intraluminal focus with no shattering as an encrusted gallbladder stone? Well, so that can suggest some tricky things. One of the uh, one of the, the, the pitfalls I haven't discussed, which is another sort of basic thing that's been described for years, which is small calculi don't necessarily shadow, right? So it depends on, on physics. It depends on, you know, the probe and the frequency that you're using and that kind of thing. So it can be problematic sometimes when you have small calculi to determine if they're actually calculi <laughs> or if there is a sludge or if they're polyps. So even that can be problematic. Um, again, a very basic thing. 
do you consider gallbladder polyp morphology stalk and ma management algorithm? Well, the, again, these are not colonic polyps. So generally we don't, um, they're typically not, you know, they usually don't have stalks. It's really, and I see gallbladder polyps all the time. It drives, they drive me, you know, got like, I let out a ug, you know, ug, you know, when I see one of them. They're they're usually not. They usually don't have stalks, so it's very unusual to see those. So typically, it's 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 maximal dimension in whatever plane you see them in. Usually, they're round or ovoid. Uh, and great questions, thank you. So, how to report gallbladder edema and congestive heart disease or ascites? Well, so it, it really is, you know, looking at everything and that everything. If it's just the ultrasound, may it not may not be clear that you're dealing with something above and beyond the gallbladder. It's 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 getting the history. It's looking at the chest radiograph if you have it. It's looking at recent MRs, CTs, etc. You know, I, the cases that I showed, I have the we had the luxury of correlative imaging. Often, you know, Katz's rule of imaging. There, there's no prior imaging when you need it, right? That that always is the case when you have. More often is the case when you have something that's problematic. And you go, God, I really wish I had a X and you don't have it. So it, it, it may just you know, require, um, you know, picking up the phone. Uh, I had a, a bless his heart, Ed Lane, no longer with us. One of the radiologists I trained with in, in Syracuse at the VA, he used to say kind of a gruff guy, but he had a party goal and he'd say, the hardest thing for a radiologist to do is to get out of his or her chair. You know, well, analogous to that, one of the hardest things to do is actually pick up the phone and talk to somebody. And I know we're like incredibly busy. And sometimes it could be, you know, a little bit later in the day when we have a, a, a chance to catch our breath. That would be that minute. Uh, but getting some information is important. How do you define distension? Well, I'm not aware. So that paper over the 2.2 centimeter actually is one of the few papers to actually quantify distension. Um, it's sort of a gestalt thing, right? I, I would say in an adult, when I see a gallbladder in long axis that's pushing like seven, seven, six and a half, seven or more centimeter, that's when I start to talking about distension, but it, it, it's sort of like a gestalt. You know, you look and you go, that gallbladder is distended. Um, next question. Do you let the patient, uh, sorry, okay. Uh, let me go up here. It says, do you let the patient prepare a three-day fat-free diet and state in the report following a con contracted gallbladder cases? Well, again, we're talking about, you know, the emergency setting. So, I mean, we generally have nothing to do with pre pre preparation of patients, so, um, you know, this is in the emergency setting and we have like no control over anything. <laughs> so, uh, would I do any, I, I don't make any recommendations for follow-up in that particular scenario specifically. Um, when should we advise the clinician to go for biopsy directly without asking for cross-sectional imaging? Um, not exactly sure what that refers to. So I'm going to skip that. Okay. Next question. It says how to di diagnose tumor factor sludge with blood tumor, very, very difficult. So, you know, common things are common, right? So uh, gallbladder cancer, thankfully, is, is really quite unusual. Um, you know, it has a very typical presentation when it's more advanced. It, it, it's, you know, elderly women, older women. It, it, it's locally invasive. It's associated with the gallstones. Um, you know, when you see a, a mass centered on the gallbladder that seems to be invading, you know, differential is a, is, you know, hyler, you know, cholangiocarcinoma, gallbladder cancer. Um, again, it's a spectrum. It runs from, you just can't see it. It's a microscopic diagnosis to um, there's, you know, focal regional wall thickening that, you know, is nonspecific. So uh, you, you try your best to put on flow, you know, color and power Doppler. It can be very difficult. And similar to scenarios like I've seen, you know, quality assurance in legal cases where the bladder, not the gallbladder, but the bladder, in the pelvis is diffusely thick, and then you, you know you just can't tell. I mean, one of my other, I'm, I get a chance to say all my favorite lines here. One of my favorite lines is, "I don't have a needle on a microscope, but I wish I did." You know, I was going to be one of the things I was going to do before I picked radiology was pathology, right? So I wish I had a needle on a microscope, but I don't. So you know, I can't tell looking at a CT what's diffuse cystitis from what's a diffuse neoplasm, and we've seen examples where there was one or the other or both. And, you know, there, you just can't tell. And so if the, the gallbladder is diffusely thickened, I don't think you can tell, you know, chronic, you know, subacute cholecystitis from neoplasm. You know, when there's a focal mass and when there's bulky nodes, it's obvious, it's easy. When it's diffuse, very difficult. When there's focal areas and you really try to put flow on and it, 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 you don't see it, 
We've seen cases where there actually is flow. Uh, you know, there's, there's microscopic vascularity, and ultrasound just wasn't able to show it. So, okay, next question, the cholesterol OCs. Well, so, you know, going back, so I get to also cite some other medical school books. So remember Robbins and Cotran? Again, I'm really dating myself here. So, um, and that's been, you know, gone through many iterations over time. So there are a variety of other cholesterol OCs, the so-called strawberry gallbladder and stuff. It's a spectrum. Again, it's mostly a, you know, histopathologic diagnosis. So that's in the differential. It, it, it was on that slide. I didn't have a chance to go into all the nuances in a 50-minute lecture, but there are a variety of other cholesterol OCs being up above me on the, you know, adenomyomatosis where you would see diffuse thickening, but you wouldn't see the, you know, cholesterol cliffs. You wouldn't have the classic findings on sonography. You would just have nonspecific thickening. So a bit less common in my experience, certainly, but in the differential diagnosis. Should every chronic cholecystitis be taken out? Well, <laughs> if, you're, if you're a general surgeon um, and, and the patient is in high risk, the answer would be yes. Um, uh, and not to implicate our surgeons, but unfortunately, I did M&M at 7 a.m. on Monday, and they did that in a patient who they thought you know, had a lot of risk factors, but they thought was, was you know, cleared for surgery and optimized and had a cholecystostomy tube for like a year, and they, it unfortunately led to a death. I mean, it, it, it just... So, you know, N equals one doesn't prove anything, but, um, you know, I, I think it, it really depends if they're surgical candidates. Um, if it was me and I was having, you know, repetitive pain and I'm a surgical candidate, would I want to have it out? Yes. Um, but, you know, again, it's, it's a patient by patient consideration. But, you know, again, the, these are most of the time, in my experience, chronic cholecystitis the diagnosis is not established based on imaging. It's established at histopathology. Next question, do you see, oh, this is coming from somewhere internationally, which is great. Uh, do you see gallbladder wall thickening in the setting of dengue fever? Well, thankfully, I, I don't see a lot of dengue fever in, in Mineola, Long Island. Um, believe it or not, we do actually see occasional tropical diseases. Um, we have, we've seen, I had, I had malaria here, you know, 30, 40 years ago as a medical student, not me, but we saw it. Um, we do see TB. We've seen a whole bunch of TB cases. We see some unusual things, but I, I've never personally seen dengue fever. I'm not, not an expert on, on tropical diseases specifically. That I'll have to look up. I'll make a note of that. Um, you know, there are, you know, certainly uh, a host of things you can see. You know, there, there was descriptions in, in, in COVID, interestingly, unfortunately, of high drops of the gallbladder in, in kids with these, you know, severe you know, sort of SARS type response uh, or MERS, whatever they were calling it, uh, severe inflammatory response with, with in kids with COVID, unfortunately. You know, there's a host of, of, of things that can happen with the gallbladder and a variety of, of unusual disorders. And, 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 and um, you know, COVID is one of them. I, I'm not aware that it happens in dengue fever. I'd have to look that up. Um, should we term calcifying sludge ball as a soft calculus? I, I would avoid that term. And, well, what's a, what's a calcifying sludge ball? I mean, it's a calculus, so I would just call it a calculus. Again, how to differentiate adenomyomatosis from cancer? Uh, there is no association to my knowledge. Again, adenomyomatosis is common. Cancer is rare. I've never seen them occur in, in conjunction with each other, and one does not lead to the other. Um, and, and so, you know, typically you'll see the, the, the usual findings at sonography. They're, they're highly specific. So I really don't think there should be a problem. But there are reports, again, in the literature of the occasional, you know, equivocal or problematic case where you go to CTRMR. And what is noted is that there should not be enhancement on CTRMR with the former, and there will be enhancement with the latter. So that's an excellent question. Again, I didn't have time to get into all of the nuances. And I think this is the final question. I managed to get to every one of these, which is great. How many common tail artifacts needed as animal and there's just subtle wall thickening? Well, Again, it, it, there's a spectrum of this. I would, again, you should be able to access the paper that I cited from um, the European literature. That's uh, a colleague of mine who edits the journal out of Italy. It's an excellent review article. I would, I would ask you to look at that. Um, I haven't memorized the article. It's been about two years since I looked at it. But I believe there's a fairly comprehensive review of that entity. And there's some other review articles, and, you know, there's a review in any of the major ultrasound textbooks. You can look at this in terms of the spectrum of it. Um, so, again, if there's problematic, you know, diagnosis, you can repeat the ultrasound maybe in, you know, three to six months. You can do MR, MRCP. 
I think the biggest problem is when there's focal thickening. I didn't mention this, but when there's focal thickening of the fundus, um, I should, should say my, my, my mother-in-law, who's uh, uh, Dominican, uh, you know, taught me about you know, la funda. So fundus comes from the Latin meaning a, a bag, and fundus is, is you know, the typical classic location, and a bit easier, again, much easier on sonography. But when you see a focal mass on CT or MR in the gallbladder, the concern is that am I missing a, you know, a tumor? Is it so the differential? Is it just a waste? Is it adenomymatosis? Not a waste like a waste of time, but a waste like a waste around the, you know, a belt. Um, is it a mass mass or is it you know, adenomymatosis? And almost always it's, it's not a malignancy, but that's the scenario where you're going to potentially do additional imaging or follow-up. So I think we got through everything, and um, I finished about seven minutes over the hour, but hopefully this answered all of those questions. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to, uh, to staff. And again, I really greatly appreciate the opportunity. We had great participation. I think we had a, over 180 participation, a participant live at the, the peak of this. And again, it's an honor to be able to do this. Thank you very, very much.